begin transmission. Well, we're not quite done with parasites yet. We've got uh, we've got one more to discuss, and by one more, I mean uh, one more at a time because we have uh, actually quite quite a few to discuss. But uh, Master Sergeant Rush woke up this morning with an itchy eye, and when he looked in the mirror, uh, when he opened his eye, he actually couldn't see from it, and what he could, and he was experiencing severe pain, and when he looked in the mirror he saw a, um, a much larger parasite in his eye than um, we have pre previously experienced. So we got rid of the Onchocerca worms that a few of us had in, um, in our eyes, but this worm is even worse. So, so this clip I'm about to show you here is a little, little disturbing. So if you're a little bit squeamish about eye stuff, maybe uh, look away. But what we can see here is an unusual looking parasite inside Master Sergeant Rush's eye. And we can see segments, so perhaps it's a segmented worm. And when we extract it, we're just going to make a little slit and then um, scrape it out. Not pleasant. I'll just let you experience this in, in silence. Uh, quite disturbing. Um, Master Sergeant Rush will probably, <coughs> excuse me, will probably need an eye patch uh, for for a while while that heals. Um, a pretty nasty parasite. And it turns out after we after we got it out and we analyzed it, we needed to sequence its 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 genome because morphologically it wasn't an annelid, it wasn't a roundworm. It actually had um, similar genes of um, a big, a tremendously diverse group of animals here called arthropods. And arthropods are um, quite reminiscent of a lot of the diversity that we have on Earth. I think this is an example of convergent evolution where we have arthropods uh, like organisms evolving on Earth and on this planet. So uh, whatever it is about them, they, um, they do well in whatever habitat they're in. And they're, they're easily, they easily diversify into all kinds of different shapes and sizes and colors and fantastic lifestyle, lifestyles and habitats. Um, unfortunately, many of them have uh, adapted to lives of parasitism. So this particular one is actually a crustacean. And this uh, crustacean parasite is, is quite unique, and that's what we'll, we'll be talking about today, is uh, this crustacean parasite and then the rest of um, the, the crustacean arthropods that I would like you to know as representative crustaceans. What was that parasite? It was not a tapeworm. It wasn't a roundworm. It was, in fact, a creature belonging to subphylum crustacea. Um, so crustaceans are things like crabs and lobsters and shrimp and armolifer, <clears throat> which is the, uh, the crustacean parasite that we talked about that we, that we saw crawling through Master Sergeant Russia's eyes. But before we get to that, I just want to provide a brief overview um, of phylum arthropoda and subphylum crustacea. These are animals that we will be talking about in lecture, so don't feel like this is the only time we're, we're going to have a opportunity to learn about them. But arthropods are um, very similar to nematodes in that they both have a hardened cuticle that they shed. So they're both members of clade ectisoa. Uh, the difference is that arthropods have jointed appendages. And there's also some other significant differences. But for now, um, we distinguish arthropods from other phyla like anicophorans and tardigrada by their jointed appendages. So they have a hardened exoskeleton, hardened cuticle that they, that they shed. They're ectisoans, and they have jointed, segmented legs. Crustaceans are one of the major subphyla of um, arthropoda, and crustaceans are unique in that they have two pairs of antennae. So the, the other groups of arthropods, the chelicerates, um, spiders and their relatives, don't have any antennae, and the hexapods, the insects, only have one pair. So crustaceans have two pairs of antennae, and they also have a hardened carapace over their whole body. So this carapace is going to cover their head and their thorax, and um, that's pretty unique to the crustaceans. All right, so that's a brief overview. We'll talk more about specifics in, in other lectures. 
Um, we have several different classes within subphylum Crustacea. This first one here is class Pentastomata, and this is a group of largely parasitic crustaceans. And it's kind of strange to think of a parasitic uh, crustacean, but there are a few. And when I'm talking about this, I want us to keep in mind the earlier in the semester we talked about specific adaptations for parasitism, and we can infer from those, uh, or knowing knowing what we know about parasites, we can infer some specific morphologies of this pentastomid parasite. So armalifer is a pentastomid parasite. It largely um, infects uh, reptiles and birds. So this is a respiratory parasite. The adults live in the lungs um, and the lung tissue of their hosts. When they lay, they lay eggs and they lay millions of eggs. So increased reproductive capacity because of parasitism. That's one of the things we talked about. Uh, the, the millions of eggs um, are laid in the lungs and then the cilia of the lungs <clears throat> through coughing and ciliary movement, they, uh, the eggs are um, carried up the trachea and then you cough them up and then you swallow them. Sounds familiar, correct? Um, then the eggs are passed in the feces and then eaten by other animals. Usually there's an intermediate host, um, often a fish or a smaller reptile, maybe a, a frog, amphibian type creature. And then the bird or the reptile or the snake. In this, in this picture here, we have, we have the inside of a snake. Um, and inside the lung of a snake, we see the long, yellow, cylindrical, wormy crustaceans there. So eventually the definitive host eats the intermediate host and um, consumes the early juvenile parasite, which then wanders through its tissue, migrating hither and thither until finding its lung tissue um, and lives there forever or, you know, for as long as it lives. Humans are rarely um, infected, but it is possible, especially if you live in a culture that eats a lot of snakes. And um, so uh, without cooking them thoroughly, you can, you can get heavily infected by these crustacean parasites. What else do we know about parasites? Well, we know they have high increased reproductive capacity. We also know that they usually have some type of um, attachment mechanism for their hosts. And pentastomids are no exception. The, the name pentastomid comes from, um, you know, penta means five. And if you look at their face, they actually have four little hooks surrounding their mouth, which is the fifth spot. So their, their heads are unique and they have these little latchy hooks that they use to adhere to their hosts. They also have a unique digestive system. Their digestive system is um, highly reduced compared to other crustaceans and it's adapted for digesting and filtering blood. They don't have a, um, a hard cuticle either, there, so that, which makes sense. If you live inside another, another organism, there's not much sense in making um, uh, an expensive exoskeleton for yourself. And so um, they, their cuticle is also highly, highly modified. So very interesting um, creatures. And you can see that these, this is kind of a deterioration into parasitism, like we talked about with the barnacles and the uh, Myrmidon screaming caterpillar parasites. Um, the the ancestors to these pentastomids were um, not parasites. They were they were um, at least commensal, probably free living, and they've lost a lot of their traits. They've lost their limbs. They've lost their sensory organs. Um, they've lost their cuticle, and so uh, this is this represents um, a transition f into parasitism from something that was not parasitic. Our next interesting creature is Triops, and Triops is a curious um, little crustacean. It looks all ancient-y. It, it, it's, uh, it's got this um, amazing dorsal carapace, very obvious, um, covering its head and thorax, and then you see the abdominal segments behind there, and it just looks very old. Uh, we, have, we have fossils of these guys going back for um, a very, very, very long time, and um, they're called triops because they have three eyes. They have a pair of compound eyes. And then right in the middle of their heads, if you look in closely, you see a third eye right on their forehead. This is called a median eye because it's right in the middle. So a median eye and then two compound, compound eyes makes three eyes, triops or triops. 
That medi median eye is also sometimes called a noplian eye after the nopleus larva that some of uh, these um, crustaceans have. So a noplian eye or a median eye. Treops are interesting. Uh, they live in ephemeral ponds in usually uh, desert environments or you know savanna type ecosystems, and um, they are uh, so they live in these ephemeral ponds, and so they lay desiccation resistant eggs. So their eggs can with, um, dry out and can be hardened and form this little powdery um, system, system, uh, powdery substance, and then you could actually ship them all over the world. You could collect them and maybe make a little company that, that collects these and puts these in little packages and um, calls them sea monkeys or something. And then uh, you could find a small business, some type of uh, business that sells all, you know, kind of arts and crafts type of things. Um, some, you know, we're a room full of fun, fun, pleasurable pastimes, you know, or, uh, you know, a hobby lobby, um, in other words, and they could then sell these little packages of desiccated Triops eggs to children, for example, and then they could add water, simply add water to this mysterious powder, and you get these wonderful little swirly, happy little um, Triops that uh, appear a few days later. Um, so this, uh, this is something um, that would be a fantastic idea and maybe something that was actually done in the past or the present or sometime. Uh, so anyway, Triops got three eyes, they live in ephemeral ponds, have desiccation resistant eggs, and would make a great little um, purchase from your local, from your local, local hobby lobby. A very small crustacean in class Copapod, Copapoda. Um, the copepods are usually very small. This one is um, microscopic. We're only going to see it with a, um, a dissecting microscope at the very least. And Cyclops, in contrast to Triops, this is going to be a single-eyed creature. And what can you tell me about that red pigment eye in the middle of his forehead? It's not going to be a compound eye. It's going to be just be a, a little retinal cup a little with little pigment cells in it. So this is going to be a median eye or a noplian eye. We have heard of Cyclops already. Cyclops is the intermediate host of Dracunculus metanensis, the guinea worm. And so the, these guys live in uh, ponds and uh, freshwater ponds usually, although there are some marine species. Um, but the ones in, marine, uh, in freshwater ponds eat the eggs of Dracunculus. And then if a human drinks water with Cyclops in it, then they can get the Dracunculus um, fiery serpent worms. What you notice on the tail end, these two white uh, uh, kind of balloons with filled with little dots, what do you think those are? Those are little uh, brood sacs. So a common feature in crustaceans is that they, they make mer uh, very good mothers. So the mothers usually have some type of a brooding behavior for their eggs. They, they take care of their eggs for a while until they, until they hatch. So what you see on even this little tiny crustacean are brood sacs for taking care of their young. So Cyclops in class Copepoda, this is an important intermediate host for the parasite Dracunculus. It has a median eye and brood sacs. In um, our marine um, expeditions, we've discovered a lot of these barnacle-like creatures. And we talked about a few of these in um, the, last, the last lecture about the barnacles that adapted to be parasitic on sharks. Um, so there are, there are many, many species in class Thecostraca, and they're characterized by having a highly reduced abdomen. And in fact, they don't really have much of an abdomen at all. Their body has modified to uh, form an attachment suction cup to attach to adhere to surfaces. And then they, their carapace encloses their whole body. Their head is highly reduced, and then their legs, um, their thoracic legs are modified into these long black comb-like structures that you see here. These are called cirri, C-I-R-R-I. -R -R and what do you think they do with those cirri? As they sit there patiently waiting, they use those cirri to filter water for organic particles and nutrients. 
So these are sessile filter feeders, like we've seen many, many times before. We see them in sponges and cnidarians and platyhelminthes. If you live in the marine environments, this is an, a great way to live. What I find particularly fascinating, the, the genus I want to talk about, uh, talk about today, Lepus, I want to talk about this one because this one is actually one uh, from Earth's history. So remarkably, crustaceans and arthropods evolved both on Earth and on this planet. So uh, this is pretty remarkable. Would this be a case of homology or um, homoplasy, where you have um, two separate lineages evolving the same characteristics? Um, good question to ask. Uh, regardless, these lepus, um, I want to talk about these lepus, Barnacles, because uh, they just have so just a wild, crazy story from Earth's history. These are called um, goose-necked barnacles, and they are called that because of these creatures here are called barnacle geese. And barnacle geese and goose-necked barnacles look identical. They are virtually indistinguishable. You know, when I put this picture up, you probably thought, "Oh, another another barnacle." Um, obviously, and when I first put 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 this picture up, you thought, "Oh, I recognize that. They're they're geese." Um, <laughs> obviously, these barnacle geese and these gooseneck barnacles um, share some affinities. Um, but what's remarkable, what I want to tell you is that um, imagine you lived. Uh, let's see, this is thirty twenty. So you're going to you're going to go back in time, you know, 15 1800 years and you're in Europe and you have these geese that appear in um the summer and then in the winter they disappear and then they appear the next summer and then they disappear in the winter. We now know that these they're migratory birds and they um they migrate, but that isn't necessarily intuitive. And for a long time, humans in Europe just thought that these barnacle geese just appeared. And so where are they actually coming from? Simultaneously to this mystery of the barnacle geese appearing and disappearing, every once in a while you would get these, um, these barnacles, these, these things washed up on shore um, on logs or rocks, and they would just be covering these, these logs and rocks. And they shared a certain affinity with these barnacle geese, you know, if you, if you have the eyes of faith. And um, there became, uh, this, this is a true story from Earth's history, there became um, a legend of a barnacle goose tree. And so um, the way they, they thought that um, uh, the barnacles and the geese, they, they thought they were the same species, the same organism. So the idea was that far off in the north of England, uh, maybe um, Orkney Islands um, or you know somewhere, there was a tree uh, that was filled with bird seeds, and the inside the, the seeds of these inside these seeds was a little bird, and when they became mature, they dropped down into the ocean and attached themselves to logs, and then they'd be washed ashore. And once they were washed ashore, then they would. Um, inside these little carapace that you can see on the barnacles is a nice little bird. You can kind of see that the Siri kind of look like feathers, perhaps, and then the shells would burst open and you get a little baby bird. And, which is, it's just remarkable, right? So the barnacle geese and the gooseneck barnacles are the same. It's just a different, it's just part of their life cycle. And, you know, imagine explaining the life cycle of some jellyfish or, you know, flatworm with just tremendously different life stages. It, you know, this isn't out of the realm of possibility, at least. But it gets even crazier because <clears throat> I think there's a little bit of an ulterior motive to this. Uh, because back in the 12th, um, 13th century, Europe was dominated by the Catholic Church. And during Lent, which is the season we are currently in, um, you were not allowed to eat meat. Um, so you couldn't eat red meat, you couldn't eat lamb or pork or um, beef, but you could eat fish. And so uh, you couldn't eat birds. No, no chickens, no geese, no ducks during Lent, but geese are delicious. And so if you have a way to classify um, these barnacle geese as aquatic creatures, you can eat them. 
And so that's what they did. They said, these are fish, and so we can eat them during Lent. And it became quite quite a big deal. And um, uh, even the, the Pope, the Holy Roman Emperor himself, dissected a gooseneck barnacle and a barnacle goose and decided, these are not the same thing, guys. Uh, they're not the same thing. So stop eating the geese for Lent um, and stop saying they're the same thing. <laughs> Which I just, it's just a, a very, very awesome historical story. Uh, do you know who, who came up with this idea, who you know popularized it at least? <clears throat> His name was Gerald. Gerald uh, did it. <laughs> look, it look it up. Uh, great story. So anyway, Lepus is the barnacle goose. They have Siri that they use to filter feed, and people used to... Um, think that, oh, I mean, Lepus is the gooseneck barnacle. Um, let's, let's be clear, they're, they're not the same thing. Uh, but historically, they used to be considered the same. All right, the largest class within um, subphylum Crustacea is class Malacostraca. And this is going to include a lot of different orders of quite diverse organisms. So we'll need to be able to differentiate um, these by uh, their orders. Our first one is a rare terrestrial crustacean. Armadillidium vulgari. These are um, when you when you when you poke them and you scare them, they roll themselves into a tight little ball. Their segments interlock and they um, form this wonderful little rolly ball. So you can call them roly polies or pill bugs or something like that. Armadillidium vulgari are important um, detritivores. They eat detritus. They're important for decomposing. They like organic um, nutrients from the soil. And they're crustaceans, so these are related to crabs and lobsters, um, but they are terrestrial. Even still, they require a lot of moisture, so they don't have uh, very good osmoregulatory systems to live in desert environments. Uh, they, they like moist, rotten logs areas. You're not going to find one just wandering around the street. It will dry up and die. One interesting feature of... Um, roly polies is if you look down if you turn one upside down and it's a female it will have these little and, and it has little babies what you see here on the posterior side these four little clumps of white tissue that is its uh, brood sac so it has um, dozens of little eggs in a brood sac so very similar to the cyclops that we saw earlier this is just further evidence that crustacean mothers um, are pretty awesome awesome mothers so this little um, morphology is called a marsupium. So marsupium is a little brood pouch belonging to Armadillidium vulgari. Mm, look at these guys. So isopods include Armid, um, Armadillidium vulgari, the roly polies. Um, also in order isopod is not a pleasant organism. This is another parasite. And uh, again, you can see that this is a derived feature because they're going to come from ancestors that are, you know, kind of similar to roly polies, although the roly polies are also derived. Um, at any rate, they're coming from non parasitic ancestors. Simithoa exigua is the tongue louse parasite. So the Simithoa exigua specializes in um, parasitizing fish, and it is highly sensitive to ammonia being re released from the fish's gills and will swim through a uh, fish's gills into their mouth, where it will then embed its hook-like claws into the tongue, slowly cutting off circulation. The tongue necrotizes, it dies, the tissue um, uh, doesn't get enough blood, and it just rots and falls, falls away. And then the tongue louse, Simithoa exigua, then just takes the place of the tongue in the fish's mouth. It embeds its claws into the fish's muscle, and then um, the fish can actually use it as it would its own tongue, but it's quite painful for the fish and um, the, the parasite then eats whatever the fish is eating. Pretty disturbing. And here's another picture. They always look so smug about it too. So Simithoa exigua, if, if you ever go fishing, um, check the fish's mouth. These are, these are not uncommon parasites. And um, if you fish a lot, this you'll, you'll probably find one of these. Also, something another thing disturbing is those fish's teeth. The, they look like uh, like human teeth, <laughs> which is strange. So, uh, Simithoa exigua is the the tongue louse parasite. 
Another um, order within class Malacostraca are the is order Amphipoda. Amphipods are um, uh, another very diverse group. Um, they kind of look like little shrimp, and this this little gamerous is our freshwater shrimp. And um, uh, gamerous or gamerous is um, a really important um, indicator of environmental changes. So they're really sensitive to pollution, especially um, heavy metals. And so if you have a, a stream or a river that has a lot of freshwater shrimp, a lot of gamerous species in it, then it is a healthy stream. And they're among the first invertebrates to die with if the stream gets uh, polluted or has um, too much nitrogen in it. So um, gamerous is a good in in indicator of environmental quality. We have also learned about gamerous before. So just like Cyclops was the intermediate ho host of Dracunculus uh, metanensis, gamerous is also an intermediate host of a parasite that we've talked about. Um, which one? Polymorphous, um, the acanthocephalin uh, worm. So polymorphous worms get into gamerous and they manipulate its behavior. They turn it bright pink and then make them attracted to the smell of ducks and then make them grab onto um, aquatic vegetations on the surface of the water. And so ducks come along and eat them all up. So, and then the parasite reproduces in the ducks. So poor gamerous is uh, a little manipulated host of uh, polymorphous worms and gets eaten by ducks. And they're good environmental indicators. So order Amphipoda, genus Gamerus. This is the freshwater shrimp. All right, let's talk about the most familiar crustaceans in order Decapoda. What does Decapoda mean? 10 feet. So these are your classic crabs, lobsters, um, crawdads. Um, these are the crustaceans that most of us are most familiar with. And they have 10 walking legs. Their, their first walking legs are modified into these these giant um, pinching chelipeds um, that, we'll, that we talked about with the crayfish dissection. Um, Uka is the fiddler crab, and it's, it's called the fiddler crab because it has one of its giant, one of its chelipeds is, is giant, and the other one is kind of normal sized. This, this giant um, claw is used to signal um, fitness for mates. So the males have these giant claws, and then they, uh, they use them to stake out territories and then they communicate to other males, I am the largest male, don't come near me or I'll fight you. And it typically works well. So this is called signaling when um, a, a fit, when, when males of a species judge each other's fitness levels visually. And uh, the benefit here is that you don't have to fight. So if one male is clearly larger, um, then it's gonna be costly for anybody to fight him. And so signaling allows, um, is kind of a, a way to avoid potentially damaging, um, costly conflict between males. Um, what this ends up being though is, well, here's a little, every day they come out and just say, hey neighbors. And all the other male, males uh, are pretty nice in, in this little video, but in real life they would be a lot more hostile to each other. And they would be saying, this territory is mine. All the females who are around here come mate with me because I am awesome and I have a very large claw. And so this is, this is signaling. Uh, deceptive signaling occurs though, because uh, remember these, these guys can molt. And um, so sometimes in battles or in just a course of life, uh, maybe a predator um, catches one, a male will lose his claw and at the next molt, they can actually grow another claw. And sometimes what happens is the, is the claw regrows faster and, and larger than the original claw was, but it comes at a price. Um, to regrow faster and um, larger, it's also significantly weaker. And so sometimes what happens is you have a, a crab that has a gigantic claw, but it was actually ever in combat, it would lose because the claw is weak. And so this is called deceptive signaling. And you can have a, um, an, an uka crab have a very large territory, and as long as nobody challenges him, it's fine. But he's really, he's really a weakling. And so it's kind of a way um, that the, the less physically fit, the less, the less strong, yeah, the less physically strong crabs 
have of kind of subverting this might makes right system and still getting mates. So deceptive signaling is when a male regrows a crab, uh, I mean, a, a male crab regrows a claw that is larger than it would be normally, but it's weaker, but it thus gets more mates because it's signaling to others that it is more fit, um, even when it's not. That's where the deceptive part comes in. One of the most remarkable creatures that we have discovered is um, Squilla, the peacock mantis shrimp. And the peacock mantis shrimp is, um, is a rem it, yeah, it's, it's just a remarkable creature. It um, has all the classic characteristics of decapods um, and crustaceans. We can see the, the two pairs of antennae. We can see the compound eyes on stalks. We can see um, a carapace right behind there. And if you compare this guy to your crawdad dissection, you should be able to find the chelipeds here, and you should be able to find the walking legs, which would be here. What are these analogous to? Those would be the swimmerettes. This would be the, the telson, the uropod, and all that stuff. So um, they're, they're very, very strange animals or swimmerettes they use to walk around on, and then their, their walking legs and chelipeds um, they use for capturing prey. Their chelipeds are particularly interesting. They're uh, club-like, so they have these gigantic clubs on the end, and they, um, they can release these with tremendous, tremendous force. Um, actually so fast, it's one of the fastest mechanism, biological mechanisms in the world, and it, it creates this cavitation bubble behind it because it's actually uh, almost f as fast as the speed of sound underwater. And so when in, uh, its prey, um, whether it's a snail or some type of mollusk, it's actually going to get hit twice. It's going to get hit once by the actual hammer of the claw, and then the shock wave from how fast it moved is also going to hit them as well. And so just the shock wave alone is enough to stun and kill some prey. So even if they miss, they can, uh, they can um, uh, kill their prey. So pretty remarkable. Here we can uh, see it in slow motion, attacking a crab from its little, little burrow. And then here, this is even um, slower motion. You can see that it, it um, you can see the cavitation bubble there. They move so fast that it actually produces a little bit of light if you have the right instrumentation to see it, um, simply because of how fast it's moving through the, the water. Pretty remarkable creatures. And that's not even the most interesting thing about um, mantis shrimp. Mantis shrimp have incredible eyes. They have the most complex um, optical system that we know of, that we've, we've seen in all of this whole planet. And one, uh, one thing I can point out is you kind of see that these, these compound eyes have three sections to them. So these, they actually have trinocular vision. Um, each of these sections is doing something a little bit differently. But even within these sections, um, well, compare this to a human eye. A human eye has three uh, pigments that it can detect, uh, red, green, and blue. And all of the colors we see are basically uh, different ratios of those um, pigments being activated in our, in our retina. So uh, with different combinations and different um, amounts. Um, so we have three, uh, three pigments, <clears throat> uh, three cones. Do you know how many cones this little decapod has? Squilla? 16. 16 uh, 16 different uh, cones. So it, so all of the colors we can see, they can see more. They can differentiate more shades of the colors that we're familiar with, and they can see into um, infrared spectrum, they can see ultraviolet spectrum, they can see polarized light. And in fact, um, one interesting application of this is that um, cancer cells actually reflect polarized light differently than regular cells. And so we might be able to um, synthetically figure out how to use this eye technology to scan someone for cancer. So they can basically see cancer with their, their special polarized light sensing um, cells. Um, why, would they, why would this be adaptive? Why would they need to see so many different colors? Um, well, we don't know precisely for sure why. Um, 
yet, um, and maybe never. Um, but they can they can see things that we don't we don't even comprehend. One idea is that female squilla are only um, open to mating during certain lunar um, cycles. And so uh, it's really important for this underwater creature to be able to see the polarized light from the moon and sync their um, uh, mating rituals uh, with the lunar cycle. Uh, so that's one explanation. They can also fluoresce. So when the females are ready to mate, they will fluoresce to attract a mate and the males can see that special uh, wavelength. Um, they also, polarized light in the ocean is really important because a lot of predators um, sneak up on prey by being essentially invisible. So they're translucent or, um, you know, think about a, sh a shimmery, shiny fish. So that kind of polarized light is going to be really important to be able to detect to avoid being eaten. So these are really remarkable creatures. <clears throat> um, don't put them in your aquarium. They, they can actually smash the aquarium glass with their, their um, claws and they can see all the colors of your sorrow. Um, at once if they do so. So squilla is the, the peacock mantis shrimp. Our last organism is um, a hermit crab and hermit crabs uh, in genus, genus uh, Cenobita or Cenobita, these, these are um, really fascinating creatures and I have a, um, there's a YouTube clip here from uh, with David Attenborough and BBC did that is better than what I can do. Um, I just, while you watch this, I want you to think about, um, uh, well, hermit crabs are crabs that use the shells of gastropods, leftover shells of gastropods as homes. So if you do that, what kind of adaptations are you going to have over time? So how are you going to adapt to that specific lifestyle? So um, when you watch that video, pay attention to the, the, uh, the, the morphologies of the lower um, half of the body and pay attention to the uh, third and fourth and fifth walking legs. What do they look like in these, in these uh, crustaceans? So check out this video, and those are our crustaceans for the day.